welcome to the Packhouse this Weiche. Uh, so nice to see many of you here. Uh, my name is Umaya Abu Hanna, and uh, together with uh, Charlie Dopp, who is the lead uh, at the uh, We Make the City and uh, responsible for international speakers too, I welcome you to this uh, special edition of uh, We Make the City um, about empowering uh, architecture. You want to share? Yes. Technology is our master. <laughs> what would I like? Are you going to run the clip of the We Make the City? Oh, no. All right. Uh, practical information. Uh, if you need the toilets, they're on that side. And then um, I'll say a few words. Uh, uh, we Make the City is an event that uh, has had the last uh, year 46,000 participants, and it had 403 events, uh, 30 events. And um, uh, this year it will be from the 17th till the 23rd of June. And these we have uh, a few special programs uh, preparing for the bigger event, and this is one of them. Um, I, am, I work at uh, a foundation, I'm a project leader at something called Rethink Amsterdam. And Rethink Amsterdam is, um, works with and at the Packhouse, this Weicher. And the idea of Rethink Amsterdam is exactly its name. So we rethink everything regarding the city of Amsterdam. And this event is part of, of that kind of rethinking. Um, we're tonight we're going to rethink the perceptions of the world we live in and let the world for in, uh, fascinate us in a positive way. I would like to ask you all to shut your eyes for less than one minute. <laughs> Can you shut your eyes? I'm going to say a few words and try to see what they bring in your mind and how they make you feel. Iraq. Iraqis. <laughs> Baghdad. Iraqi women. Now you can open your eyes, and what just happened was not only your own little bubble imagining and feeling, uh, but it was also our collective conceptions of places and people and cultures. And this collective uh, conception is also built with our culture and the media, so it's not only your private imagination. We also like to think that we are one of the most informed citizens in the world. Huh? We live in a free society. We have access to any information that is available. Huh? And we are have liberal minds. We live in Amsterdam. But keep in mind what private images and thoughts you had in your mind a while ago until the end of the program. And let's see how these things combine. Why do we have this event tonight here? Well, the Netherlands is contributing a lot of know-how to uh, many places, especially about building cities. Amsterdam is a very old, very well-built city, has been a, a model even for, for cities for a long, long time. Um, and at the same time, when we go to help rebuild post-war uh, places, I don't know if you have noticed, but uh, the images that we get are of total ruins, and then you have a wonderful Westerner who stands there in front of the big rubble and thinks, poor them, now we have to help them. It's like the savior thing. And um, why we're having this event is because I started reading about, first about Aleppo and then later about Mosul. And everything I read about was the poor Iraqis were just in the rubble. They were doing nothing, running around, and when they were very good people, they were carrying the rubble getting one, uh, I think, $10 if they pick up the rubble. And then there was this, these Western men, basically, who come from the UN and other places, who are very good, good-hearted, good people, but they were alone in this mission to save these places. And I thought, I'm originally Palestinian, and I thought, well, I know better. <laughs> Iraqis have a long history of of being intelligent, building the world. It's an old ancient history. It's not uh, only, well, Zaha Hadid is a, is a very special person, 
but she didn't grow up in a vacuum. So I started researching. And while I was researching, do I find students of architecture, do I find architects in Iraq, Iraqi architects abroad, I stumbled on something very funny. Suddenly I realized, oh, who is the mayor of Baghdad? And the mayor of Baghdad uh, had a PhD in engineering, civil engineering. And the mayor of Baghdad is working nearly hands on in all sites. All the photographs are of the mayor of Baghdad with engineers and builders. And the mayor of Baghdad is a she. And the mayor of Baghdad, who is a civil engineer with a PhD, has been a mayor of Baghdad since 2015. I've never heard of her. Here in Amsterdam, we were so proud when last year we got our first female mayor. And we were so happy. We have a female mayor. We have to show the world that we are equal. And in a city where 51% of the population is non-white, it's one more white mayor, but still we have proceeded in our um, diversity. So the mayor of Baghdad opened my eyes. I was like, I started researching more. Her name is Dikra Jeber Alush, Alush. And um, it is hard to find photographs of her, of her other than on site. She's always in her jeans with a scarf and working. And she mentions that when she was nominated uh, as a mayor, she was told, welcome, now you're the mayor and you have zero budget. Deal with it. <laughs> she said that in 10 years, she has to manage that. Um, our mayor has 80,000 inhabitants, has a budget, a fully functioning system, and we can stop, uh, you know, like we lost our cool about uh, that, which is great. I'm very proud to have a female mayor in Amsterdam. But we've never heard of that other mayor in Baghdad, while we read a lot about the news about the war, who has uh, nearly, she has 9 million people, like half of the Netherlands in a post-war situation with no budget, and she's working. So I started doing more research, and, there, and then I realized that the head of the Department of Architecture at Baghdad University, a professor of theory, philosophy, and preservation of architecture in the Department of Ar Architecture College uh, of Engineering, and member of the higher committee of the basic design of Baghdad City is another woman. And then I thought, okay, and then I was searching who else of these ladies is building uh, Baghdad. And then I stumbled on a project that is a street uh, initiative on Facebook. And it was full of normal people just, please help me do this. And they said, oh, we, sorry, this is a new initiative. Uh, we'll try to do this and that. And then I took my glasses off and I sat on my sofa and I was thinking, who is behind this? And then I found a name and I Googled that name and uh, I was a little bit astonished because Rayani's work popped on my computer or my laptop. And I was thinking, okay, um, we don't know much about, about what the positive sides of the world, the positive energy in the world. So that's beautiful. It's not finding more corpses and despair, just the opposite. So um, um, I contacted this uh, lady and she said, oh, do you know what? I'm in Amsterdam soon for um, one of my designs in uh, Frame Awards, and uh, her design won the award of the audience uh, vote. And she is now in the house. Uh, she's uh, Rayani. I'll introduce her shortly. Uh, we're lucky to 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 have uh, Miss Rayani with us. And um, yeah. Rayani received her BSc in Architectural Engineering from Baghdad University with distinctions and an MS in Architectural uh, Studies from MIT, where she was awarded the Harvard MIT Aga Khan Scholarship. She was the president of the American Institute of Architects Middle East. She is a licensed, a licensed architect in the state of New York and a U.S. Uh, Green Building Con Council accredited professional. She was named one of the top most powerful architects in the Middle East by Design Mena in Dubai. She is the founder and design director at Rowe New York uh, City Architects with an office in New York and another in Dubai. She will share with us some of her work. The program is made of three parts. The first part is empowering women. Then we have a short Q&A about the project that she will introduce. The second part is empowering sustainability with a Q&A, empowering communities, 
and Q&A. Please welcome Rayaani Misani. The stage is yours. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, thank you, Umaya, for like organizing everything and the team. Um, and thank you so much for coming over. Um, so, so the first project, I think I'm going to turn my head. Yeah. You, you can stand if you want. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's lit. Yeah. I think maybe can everybody see you, or is it better if you turn? Oh, I'm not sure. Can you turn it to the camera? So um, the first project is the women's building in New York. And the whole story of empowerment is an interesting story because uh, it's one of those things that I realized with time that this is what I'm meant to do, I guess. And it's interesting if I go back to 1991, uh, there were uh, war planes uh, in the sky. And um, the warplanes were actually making these signs in the sky. They're very, very comfortable. And we are there, people underneath, like wondering what our uh, future will be. I, at that time, had no hope that I will survive that um, wartime. That time was very influential uh, to, <laughs> to what happened afterwards. Uh, because that moment when I felt very powerless, um, I felt that actually someone else has my destiny in their hand, and I felt that I shouldn't be in that position forever, and I have to make a change. At that point uh, is the, um, the drive that uh, took me um, to leave Iraq uh, in a very difficult situation and um, move actually ultimately to the U.S. And um, so... So what happened is that since then, I decided to empower myself. And then I didn't know later that I will be always inspired to empower other people. So the first project is a project that is very interesting. Uh, somebody wrote me a message on Facebook and said, uh, this project looks like something you should do. It was a competition. Uh, and um, they were the people who were invited to only compete for it is women women architects, but they have to be in leadership positions, so there's like a very tough screening process. So I passed the first three, uh, three uh, screening pr process, and then I was shortlisted again, and I uh, became on the finals list to enter a competition to design the women building in New York. And what is the women's building in New York? It's a, a prison. It's a correctional facilities for women in uh, Midtown, uh, in, uh, in Manhattan on the west side downtown and this is actually the building it's a historic sorry 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 i jumped it's a historic building is there a pointer on this it doesn't have to have a pointer but okay so this is actually the building it's a historic building so it's a landmark building that we have to save uh, used as a prison uh, and you can see it's a brick building has very small windows and on top of the building there is some sort of cage um, these, uh, this is the space where women used to um, go up in their break, uh, that were, uh, they were allowed to take these small breaks, and they will hang out in that area. And people who have been to New York probably know uh, the High Line, the High Line, which is like this very cool <laughs> landscape uh, area that is elevated. Um, it actually has a view. You can have a view of it from that platform. So actually women um, would uh, see life going by, uh, with kids and uh, p families and uh, people uh, on bikes passing by them while they are encaged in this place. Uh, and then what happened is, um, you remember the hurricane that happened in New York, and uh, it was flooded, and so they moved all the prisoners to the suburbs. However, that was one of the coolest prisons in New York because it's very rare to have prison in, um, in the city because uh, your relatives can easily come and see you. So, um, so then they decided to take it on, to take the building and convert it to into a hub for women's empowerment. So basically, that's kind of the intention of uh, the building. So the competition was how to design this building and how to uh, transform the space. So one of the bigger, uh, the biggest issue is that you have a landmark building, <coughs> while at the same time um, you want to open up the building. So the design 
uh, what we did is uh, uh, we grouped up, uh, grouped the openings on the ground level to make larger openings. To so we have infiltration of people from the groundscape into the building, and so we have intera uh, uh, interaction, and then people can come in and experience the building. And I know I don't have a lot of time, so and uh, each project of this takes a long time, but I hope I can get like certain ideas across through this presentation. So this is um, uh, our vision of how uh, this uh, space groundscape opens up and allow people to come in. And you can see the contrast between the existing brick building and into all the insertion of uh, uh, more light-filled uh, material that reflects light uh, and, uh, and creates a certain ambience. Um, this is the brick building, which we actually saved up. And if you see on the first and second level, you see the openings where um, you can feel like uh, the light coming through and that uh, ceiling treatment. The major idea behind it is uh, was how to create these spaces that liberates women and feels the woman can be part of its creation, which is uh, inside the building. And it goes up because we had to uh, create a certain number of um, floors is to accommodate uh, because it's a large uh, building. So we inserted that uh, high rise with it. And the thing that you see climbing up is actually part of what we call vertical neighborhood that we carved into the space. And this is actually my uh, sketch when I uh, thought about it is how to create this uh, vertical neighborhood that actually starts from the ground level and goes up all the way to the roof where th you had the cage and how we could create that space. And then it travels up in the building vertically. So the spaces were spaces of expression, like, um, um, and it's interesting because um, when I did this project, I really needed contact with the end user. Um, and because it's supposed to be a hub for women's empowerment, a lot of women who were actually prisoners, uh, they were uh, into a program that to educate them so when they um, leave the prison, uh, they could uh, do something with their lives that is, uh, um, that is positive and they can make change and all that. So some of them became uh, lawyers, uh, so they would come back and use that space. So uh, it's very interesting because I interviewed these women. I was not supposed to, but I believed I had to, so I did it. So I uh, found these women who actually were um, in this prison before. And I talked to them, and they explained to me the space and all that. Because the irony uh, is that there is like a, it's a landmark building, so there's a lot of beauty in it, but also there's a lot of restrictions in it, and there's a lot of memory in it. And how to transform that? It was a very much uh, about um, you know talking to these women and understanding the space through them. Um, so we created these spaces where you can have a free expression, uh, and also like these. Um, uh, weaved uh, weaved threads is basically women creates it. So what we did is we created the neutral environment in which women come and weave their um, uh, their uh, weave their environments, and and it could be an added layer that could be with time be added. So it's it's not controlled, so they can uh, weave their own uh, ex uh, expression. And these uh, this is like the building, and you can see the vertical neighborhood that actually goes up and goes up uh, to the building. Um, and the rooftop of the building is, um, um, it was like the most critical one for us because that was the moment of liberation. So we wanted uh, to have this idea of he uh, heads uh, in the cloud, uh, representation where like you can't even tell what the, how the structure is supported because it's supposed to be it feels this more dreamlike and uh, and we wanted uh, actually to be kind of has that sense and it doesn't have to have a function we believe that it has to have this very symbolic expression of um, like true um, like when you are thinking about your dreams and your future and it's uh, you feel like you are in the clouds so that's kind of the top of the building. And that's the view of it in the city of uh, New York. So that project number one. Any questions? I'm happy to answer. <laughs> There's your mic now. Any questions about this project? No, I, I maybe missed it, but um, the program of the of this building, a lot of square meters. What was the program exactly? Because it was not going to be a prison again. 
No, no. It's co been uh, converted to offices. Yeah. So it, mainly offices and, of course, uh, programs that is related to offices. Uh, but it is basically offices that gets rented by women uh, who are activists or men who are activists for women causes. I was wondering what was exactly the argumentation behind the choice of the concept to uh, create this uh, house of empowerment for women specifically. Uh, to create, sorry? Say it again. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, why exactly was the choice made for empowering of women specifically in this case? I understand the connection to the female prison. But uh, 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 yes, uh, so uh, how was the process? I mean, how did it? Uh, how was the decision made? Okay, so it it is uh, developed by a real estate developer who has a strong woman figure, and I think they are the one who um, were convinced that this, sh since it is a, w a prison for women, because you know, like this area, the real estate is very expensive, and. They knew that they will, uh, some developer will take it and bring uh, and build like condominiums for, and they believed this real estate uh, company believed that this should be related to women, and since it was prison before, should be converted to the opposite. It's uh, a place of empowerment. So I think that was their vision, and they are the one who put. Uh, they're called the Goran Group. They are the one who put the vision and the competition together. Uh, and they insisted that uh, only women can apply for it and that the contractors will be women, everything will be empowering women. Any more questions? Yeah. I, I have a last one. Can I just say? Uh, we, we have a live stream. So oh, oh, sorry, I didn't know. Hi, um, I was wondering, um, I, I think I assume that you won, but why do you think your design has won the prize? Uh, no, the I didn't. I didn't win. Oh. Uh, I got I got shortlisted uh, with seven women, and uh, the woman who won is actually uh, her name is Deborah Burke, who's a very well known. And she's I think the dean of Yale University. I don't know if she's still the dean, but anyway, very uh, established woman, and um, uh, she won. Um, However, I was asked to probably do parts of the building, maybe the rooftop, but uh, things uh, hasn't um, progressed in a fast manner, so I think it's a very slow process because there's a lot of uh, lobbying that happens with this because it's, uh, it's a landmark building and there's a lot of um, um, challenges that you go th they, they're going through. More questions? I think I miss it. Uh, the cage become what becomes the cage of the cloud? Yes. So the c the image of the cloud yeah. is what happens on the t uh, on the rooftop of the building. So oh, instead of the cage. Yes. Yes. So the cage was removed, and the cloud is replacing that. Beautiful. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? All right. We go to our next uh, next part. Okay, so uh, the next project is actually the first project I worked on uh, when I established m my own office in 2012. And though the, uh, the office was established in 2012 in New York and in 2014 we established the Dubai office, again, um, I somehow cannot escape um, uh, wanting to empower um, uh, projects that are in Iraq, though I have to say it's very challenging. Um, but um, even if I have to do visionary project, but I believe that uh, doing it uh, will inspire other people and uh, they might take pieces of it and, and develop it further. So for me, the value of it, uh, it doesn't stop by the fact that um, if it gets built or not, of course, we all architects want things to be built. But uh, that doesn't stop me because if I think if uh, if I get stopped by what I cannot do uh, and what I cannot do 
uh, is reliant on others, others, then I'm really limiting myself. So, so that's my approach. So this this project is um, something that was um, close to my heart because it's again about empowerment and. Um, having lived in Iraq, um, when I felt uh, I felt like two things, right? That uh, people feel um, uh, um, they need to be empowered, uh, which is they need to be um, they need to be living in a place that is safe, um, and um, and they they have a good way of uh, having a good life, right? Like uh, economically, they need to be secure, and they need safety, and they need uh, you know. Uh, live, uh, to live in peace. So uh, the marshes of Iraq is a place that is was um, very vulnerable to political pressures um, because of political situation. Um, and the marshes is, um, oh, I keep thinking this is a pointer, but it's not. Uh, so the map on the upper left side is where the marshes are. And uh, these, this is uh, a picture of the marshes, I believe, in the 70s, if I'm mistaken, not mistaken, in the 70s. But uh, the marshes were a very interesting uh, place. It's, a, it's um, wetlands in the southern part of Iraq. Um, and up to the year 2000, it was uh, hugely compromised. Uh, the water was cut from the marshes. Um, and uh, they were in like they were in a place where it was they were about to uh, disappear. Up to the year two thousand four, um, the people, the indigenous people, left the marshes and start going to bordering cities to um, to escape the situation uh, there because there was no way of uh, living the way they used to live before. They used to raise buffaloes. They used to rely on fishing, and they draw and they um, used to uh, take these canoes around. Um, and when the water was cut uh, uh, from the marshes, you can see here, there was like a lot of problems uh, with the soil condition. It was, has a lot of salt. And they were, uh, when the Ma'dan people, the name of the people who lived uh, in, in the marshes, when they came back, they didn't find any way to um, have a way to live um, in, in those marshes. So, th uh, so that was something very... Um, Something that um, made me think, how could you create something, uh, a resettlement uh, solution for these marsh, uh, marsh people? So when they come back, they, they, they can have a viable way of living. And I know, I know you're probably going to see it's very kind of, people think it's a very visionary project. I, I, I do not think so. I think it's, uh, I'm using uh, ideas and um, uh, techniques and processes that is already used, maybe in a smaller scale, uh, and this is more larger vision, but it's kind of the main ideas are there. So what I thought of is, what do you need? You need to produce your own food, and you need to uh, be economically independent, so you can generate your own money uh, and your own produce. So basically, I envisioned there are four slim structures four slim structures, and each one of them has a purpose. So one of them is the green structure, which is the one on the left, and that is where the vegetables and even the rice, the barley, the wheat, uh, all the things that they uh, used to rely on, you can grow it on this uh, hydroponic system that actually rotates around like in this spiral that um, is responsive to the sun uh, impact on it. Then next to it is the structure of water, and that's where there is a largest fish tank, um, and there is like a, a, a complete uh, relationship between these two uh, structures. Uh, uh, there's a symbiotic relationship because what the fish reject, the plants needs, so there's no waste. The third structure is actually processing. So it processes organically all the uh, fish produce as well as the uh, plant produce, uh, like uh, vegetables or fruit. The fourth one is actually how people live. So it's kind of we abstracted the concept of how they live, which they uh, live on uh, these uh, islands, floating islands called kibasha, and they build their houses in a day. So this is kind of a structure that gets erected in a very short time, prefabricated, and they are stacked on top of each other. So these four structures is what um, we needed to make this concept work as a resettlement uh, kind of uh, option. 
And each uh, structure has its own purpose, as I explained. So this is the green structure, and you can see how um, the planting of the vegetables and rice. And this is the water uh, structure. And this is the, res uh, the residences where they are, as you can see up there, the house and all the skin has a hydroponic system and they have a fish tank. And this is the original kibasha thing and how it was abstracted uh, to generate that concept. This is the skin of each uh, of the residential uh, unit. And you can see how we are trying to grow uh, the uh, fruits and herbs and vegetables on the skin and uh, how each uh, one has uh, its own fish tank with a growing tray for uh, vegetables. <coughs> and then all four structures are like uh, connected together through connective tissue that is made uh, out, uh, of shrilk, which is uh, something that we researched and uh, MIT was uh, doing um, uh, research on it and had developed certain um, material out of it, which is made out of waste of shrimp. And uh, basically, it's a very st uh, solid structure, and that makes the tissue of that connected. And that whole uh, thing is basically where you have your community services, like uh, anything related to education, entertainment, health, and commercial part. And this, this is the uh, vision of those uh, structures. They are supposed to be pointy towards the top and towards the bottom. It kind of um, evokes the sense of the reeds that are very famous in the marshes. They are very slim, um, and so they look like they're nearly vanishing towards the sky and vanishing towards the ground. And their skin is, uh, the skin is all solar skin, so it is uh, responsive to the environment. And this is the vision of uh, the each layer of the residential um, area. Um, and the skin is all made out of a system of uh, reed-like structure. And it has further purposes of cleaning the water and um, bringing it back to, to, the, to the nature again. And we have also harvesting plant. There's a whole like system uh, that we thought about uh, in terms of how we may can make it a full sustainable uh, living. Any picture I can uh, go to it if somebody wants to look at something. Questions? <coughs> what stage is this project at? What's that? What stage is this project at? Um, as I mentioned early on, uh, this is a visionary project that um, um, it was published, got a uh, honor award for its vision. Um, and uh, as I said, is that I, when I did this project, it's not something that there is a client for it, you know, and it's b because you can imagine uh, uh, it's very hard for clients to be convinced by something uh, that is looks like very visionary. But I think that, like, for example, I had someone from Iraq calling me and saying that they had an old uh, building. And what do I think we can do with it? And I said, well, we can do a hydroponic system and we can grow fruits and vegetables um, and and you know, they liked it, whether they're gonna do it or not. But it's it's that's the purpose of this, is that, I mean, if I can achieve all of that, that will be great. But um, the value of doing such work, um, I think it, it's important because people can take it. And, and I've seen like, I mean, this was done 2012. And up to now, I've seen a lot of students, a lot of things were inspired and actually did projects based on that. So I think that um, I'm, I'm never discouraged by the reality of um, 
thinks that doesn't happen because it's a larger vision because I still think the value of it, it goes beyond uh, it's whether it's built or not. And when you talk about students, you talk about students in uh, Iraq. Um, and not only that, like I, when I um, uh, when I lecture students in uh, even India, I, I mean, I was surprised because they applied to my office after and I was like, wow, this project looks like this project. So I think it inspires a lot of people because like you go to India and they say, oh, we have this issue also in this uh, area. So it's, it's very interesting to see its impact, like when people do something that is, you know, um, that has a vision and the vision is empowering empowering you you will see it it spreads very quickly and that's that's the value of it another thing uh, good to know is that uh, when i heard about this i thought this is empowering diversity because uh, iraq is a big country and we don't mm, know about all the different kinds of uh, of diversity that is not religious that is not ethnic but this is like a way of living that's been going on for thousands of years. And this kind of group of people does not have anyone to defend them, really. Like, who has the time? Climate change, this is drying, we have war. So just simply thinking with this kind of group that is totally marginalized, has no time or, or voice, and not only thinking about some, uh, like thinking with them about a future that is like a, a postmodern, that is already empowering uh, the, the way of thinking about a country and its different citizens. I, I love that because of... of uh, yeah, I, I think yeah. I need to also mention something very important. Uh, when I was doing this 2012, it was uh, UNESCO did not list it yet in their list of uh, sites, but and it's only in 2016 when they did that. But it was a, a, a kind of heartbreaking because it's like a, a, it should be on their list, but it was not... Uh, in their list till up to 2016. Um, when it nearly disappeared. Well, first of all, I'm uh, intrigued by this visionary project, as you call it. Um, so I won't elaborate on it because I'm curious hearing about the next project uh, in Baghdad, street and neighborhood. Um, but I have a question for this. Um, would it be interested for interesting for you to bring this visionary thing to the people living there in the marsh or probably wanting to go back and reestablish their traditional way of living because there is a lot of um, ingredients that you already said you used from the traditional way of life and also uh, for the area that you took this information from and I was just wondering that the high rise as I more or less uh, call it um, is not the way that they could deal with it, even if there would be a structure that would be possible to construct it. So uh, but my question is, is it possible to make another project with the same ingredients and deal with the day-to-day -day life that the people could probably reestablish there? Because as I understand now, there is no, except for a UNESCO nomination, nothing going on there. Or how does it develop this area? at the moment? So uh, I know of uh, uh, Italian um, group uh, companies that were doing things and they were trying to recreate it exactly as is, which I think something is good and it should be done, but I don't think it's the only thing you need to do. And I also think that uh, Madan people had left to border cities, places where there are apartments and that type of living. So, uh, and it was a harsh move, uh, something that completely is different from their environment that they had to adapt to. But they didn't have a choice because they d don't have a, a, um, a viable option to go back. So, and I don't know if I'm answering exactly your question, uh, but, but I think that um, uh, w when I think about this, I think that if if I'm uh, if I'm one of those people, that's what I would be interested in. If I really want to go back to a place that I feel connected to, then I want the most important thing for me is that I can live comfortably without worrying about my source of income. Uh, and if I'm back to a place that I love and I'm connected to, and I'm uh, and I'm offering that choice for them that they can have that independence, which is something that they were challenged with. 
like like now if I was challenged with certain safety issue in Iraq and if I go back I uh, that's very difficult it's a traumatic experience, and you cannot go back unless you feel that there is a, a better option for you. So that's how I see it. I see it that if you uh, give people uh, an opportunity to come back and you give them their source of living unquestioned, and they and they have a, a space for them to grow, and and can they be uh, you know they can grow their economy, um, and they become self uh, uh, sufficient, then that's really. Uh, that's really the best thing you could uh, offer them. If I may comment, uh, while uh, checking the situation also in Iraq, <laughs> there's not enough money to build the, like as I mentioned, the city of Baghdad had a zero budget, like deal with it. So the, um, there's a lot of need. And if you want to reconstruct a place like this that has also a climate problem and a, a dry land and the whole idea is of land, then you need a lot of, you need like a serious investment. Plus, I personally don't believe in just restoring things as they were because we are not in that place. One of the projects that, one of the uh, uh, master plans that uh, I was reading about um, uh, had uh, people behind it that said that now in 2019, Iraq needs 6,000 new schools, but there is work, and they were reaching out for international cooperation, and even like, well, please come. And then, I don't remember the, the guy's name, I think you might know him. Um, he said uh, that uh, they built, uh, 17 new cities were built, and then after they finished 17 new cities, they realized they need 30 new cities. So <laughs> also like the displaced, you have a new population that has been displaced, new connections, new people. So you also need a new way of, I think, just simply airing people's minds is very healthy because you, you're not in your old community. You have to think with new labels. Uh, everything that used to be home or similar is, is broken and you have, you have to think about, about that again. Yeah, that's... Uh, Thank you so much. Um, well, actually, I'm from Baghdad, and I love your project, your Invigeric project. But, and uh, I have just have, s have small comments. I, I disagree, Mrs. Amina, with you when you said like Baghdad has zero budget to develop, because I know uh, because of Iraq suffering from many political issues and, uh, and corruption also as well. That's why we can't move forward. We can't develop. And uh, I believe Iraq, one of the best countries selling uh, oil, investing in oil. Uh, and I think all Iraqi people and young young uh, uh, Iraqi uh, people have many projects in mind. They, they study here, they develop here, and they want to do it in their uh, home country. But the problem, the unstable situation there, it's not helping anybody to come back and to uh, uh, build, uh, make his idea, make his dream come true in his country. Uh, and I think I have just small questions. Is because I visited that place before, and I know how beautiful is that place, uh, and I know like many places in Iraq need to be developed and uh, regarding regarding the sustainability and helping people to move back from cities to the rural rural areas. So, um, how far you can see your project uh, uh, from coming um, to be built to be to be reality? soon like uh, not just a visionary program but it can be it can be really happen one day how far do you think <laughs> thank you thank you um it's really hard to tell i i don't think about it this way uh, because i have no control over it it's out there it's published it got awards uh, i keep mentioning it but if i if i um if I keep wanting this to happen, I will get frustrated. And if I get frustrated, uh, it will affect my energy to try to do more of these initiatives. Because as you know, in Iraq, it is very, it's very hard to continue your uh, enthusiasm and your, or your push forward because there's so many obstacles you face. So I can't let that get in the way. So I don't think about it till it really happens.
Hello, yeah, that's the question I have now because you mentioned it's a visionary project. So how do you want to carry this vision forward? Because of course, reality is a little difficult. So how do you want to build on this vision? What further message you want to add on to this project or carry on this flame? Because vision by definition is something which will go over your frustration. So how do you want to build it further? I mean, um, I think that when you present a visionary project, I, I would tell you, that th there's a client another, the other day, he was trying, uh, and I'm gonna use the word seduce me, uh, not seduce me in other ways, but seduce me to take a project that is, um, he has a master plan. And he was, uh, is this gonna be on TV? <laughs> okay, so he's gonna be upset with me, but anyway. Um, he was trying to convince me to do this project for him. And because he knows, you know, where my weak point is, which is, you know, <laughs> projects as such. Uh, so he says, well, if you do this project for me, uh, we will go in, in the marshes and we do what we want. And I was like literally laughing uh, within myself. I was like, no, because I know how he thinks. Uh, he's very money oriented. So he will never, never <laughs> do something like that. I, I know he will not. But it's funny because he used it, right? He used it. So this is the power he had over me. And I am very conscious of my passion that is not to be used um, to take away from the positive thing that uh, I, uh, I do. So I would still say that the impact of this is far reaching whether it gets built or not. That's what I would say. I wanted to add to that. I mean, you sort of segued into what I wanted to com comment about because I think what the beauty of this project is is your way of thinking, your way of approaching the problems. And it's not just a marsh problem. I mean, we are, we're undergoing climate change. Uh, the sea levels are rising. Your vision of how to deal wi with that, uh, your process, your way of thinking about it, that's, that's your contribution to us, to everyone. And I think we're gonna go and run with it. You know, it, does, it may not necessarily end up being those reed light structures, but exactly. uh, you've exactly given right. us shoulders to stand on. Yes, yes, that's true. built up by this indigenous people living in the marshes and the problems that the marshes are drying up there is a reason of course a, a great infrastructural problem there which you cannot solve by a building we know on the other hand if it would be possible to reuse these traditional methods and ways that you kind of reestablish them and whether they are high rise buildings i don't really care it's about the principle True. that's what i meant if you can, and that's what I also meant by my question, can you also kind of reorganize your principles absolutely. that you put in this visionary project? Absolutely, absolutely. And hand them over, you know, absolutely, locally. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that's what I meant Correct. to, and Correct. the Correct. lady was talking about sustainability. Yes. This question is not just for the margins in Mesopotamia. Yes. Because that's where it is, I exactly. guess, right? Exactly, exactly. It's, it's correct, it's correct. All right. No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. We are, we are busy. We're going to do Hollywood movies. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go to the, <laughs> to the next part. <laughs> okay. Zuqaq and Mahalla. Okay, so how this project came about. Um, in 2016, 2016 um, I, was, um, I was running for a vote. I got, um, 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 there was an election at the American Institute of Architects Middle East chapter, and I was selected as the future president for 2017 and vice president 2016. <coughs> At the same time, there was this program called Iraq Public Policy and Leadership Program, IPLIP. They were looking for Iraqi leaders, future leaders, 
who are interested in being in a group of Iraqis, like around 15, 15 to 18. They come from different disciplines. Um, and there is an Iraqi um, uh, person with his family who is funding this program. And the program is at the American University of Sharjah. And I was, v it was very difficult because I, I run my own office and I, uh, you know, I'm a very um, hands-on designer. It's not like I delegate. I mean, I delegate, um, uh, I mean, I still work with people, but I, I'm very much hands-on. So, uh, so my time is very limited. And here I am vice president and the first president of, a uh, first woman president at the American Institute of Architects Middle East chapter, which is a very challenging chapter. Middle East is not an easy re region to be president of uh, an organization like AIA. So anyway, it was very intense. And I was like, um, I was like so divided. Uh, how can I take this on? Because that's a huge responsibility. And then I did it. And it's basically, it's your only day off you have that I have to take this. And there are classes, basically classes to teach you different things about uh, law, about um, corruption. Um, and they're all related to Iraq, right? Economy. And uh, the interesting part is you have all these people from different fields that you talk to uh, during the sessions and you, you come up with, you brainstorm together and all that. So this is the child of that program. So basically, these are the name of the people that were with me. We, we sat and we were thinking about uh, what will, will our paper for this class would be about. And then we came up with this idea of it's, let's like try to help Iraqis um, kind of rebuild their city and how we go about it. So it started with an idea by the group of people here. And um, uh, I start, uh, you know, being an architect and uh, being very, um, you know, interested in these type of topics, I kind of uh, adopted it, um, you know. So I kind of pushed it forward uh, in the sense that I really want it to happen, to make it real and not, not stay as a policy paper. So that's kind of how it started. So... Um, So the, the issue that um, Iraq has, and we, th we thought to start with the city of Baghdad, and then uh, uh, um, that other cities can adopt it, uh, the adopt the same c uh, concept, as you were mentioning, is the system, the system of uh, what we are doing, and someone, some other, um, uh, other uh, cities in Iraq can adopt it and change it to meet what they need. So um, w we sat and we thought about what we are trying to do. And we realized the biggest problem that, uh, and I'm c just talking about Baghdad, but I'm not saying other cities doesn't uh, struggle through the same issues, is trust. Um, there is no trust uh, between people. And that has uh, become a big issue. Um, so, um, no, I need this. <laughs> so the problem is on the Iraqi street, <laughs> Uh, we realized that we cannot really m um, make change without rebuilding trust. And the reason why, because um, Iraq was divided uh, for uh, political and religious reasons, or religion, you, you know, you can um, say, um, you, can, you can have an, a position on how you look at it, but anyway, the bottom line is uh, the Iraqi society was divided. Um, uh, divided, and that happened uh, in the same street. So people were um, uh, were pushed out of their houses to go into another neighborhood because it, it it belongs to another sect of religion, and that's what happened. So it broke down the society, and we had this issue on this uh, on those uh, streets. So the zuqaq and mahalla comes from when you have an address in Baghdad, you have uh, a number for zuqaq, which uh, represents the street. And Mahalla represents the neighborhood. So it's uh, every Zuqaq has a number which represents the neighborhood. And uh, um, Mahalla is the neighborhood and Zuqaq is the street. And then you have a house number. So the idea is that uh, how can we help uh, uh, Iraqi people rebuild their streets one Zuqaq at a time? Um, and I, I, I'm going to flip th uh, through this quickly and I can go to it. So. We, we thought, and I met with the, the mayor uh, recently, 
um, in, in one of my visits to Baghdad to talk to her about this initiative. Because, of course, if we get government support, that's great. But again, I don't, uh, I don't believe we should rely uh, on, um, uh, you know, on government when the government is uh, going through different challenges and maybe they are not doing things uh, efficiently. So we have to do it more of grassroots, uh, more bottom-up uh, approach. Um, so I thought uh, I thought we can put this um, list of people who can work with us to make this happen. I am now just a strategic um, strategic leader on the group because the gr uh, the concept has been um, passed on to the group who will take it further. Um, so basically, the, there is like um, it's a very multidisciplinary group. So I just happen to be an architect, but there is all sort of people who has to be involved in this and to make it happen um, from all different aspects. So these are, um, and they're on, on different experiences because it's very important to recognize that you have to use human resources. You know, there is, uh, human beings are resources, of course. And they are, as you said, there are many Iraqis inside and outside Iraq that uh, has potential or can get they can have really um, uh, a serious contribution to uh, to advance the situation of Iraq. So this initiative is based on uh, resources that are inside Iraq and outside Iraq. And uh, there's a board of supporters that include, like for example, Dikra, Dr. Dikra Anwesh is one of them. Um, whether she's going to be able to help us as a government um, uh, employee <laughs> or is, as an individual, because it's very interesting. As uh, I just came, uh, I was two weeks in Iraq to push an, a different um, initiative, and I realized that everyone who is <laughs> um, a government employee is scared. So there is a culture of fear that has happened in Iraq that is very unfortunate, but it's something that uh, we have to deal with. Because if there is a fear, because there is no trust. So it's very, it gets very complicated. So we realize that um, Iraq needs people outside of Iraq to work with them, but it cannot be, as um, Maya was saying, it cannot be like, okay, I know better than you, and that's why you need to do what I'm telling you. That doesn't work. So it needs to be more integrated, and um, and and I believe both of the outside and the inside both need each other, but but because one left and one is still there, there is this kind of um, uneasy relationship, which is understandable. But it's something that is um, a challenge that we have to cross, and it also depends. Some people are open to it, some people less open. But that's kind of basically the challenges we go to. So you have board of supporters, which are different uh, disciplines, who are advising on how we we can make this happen from different aspects. We also wanted to gather the stories of people who are older generation, let's say. And we are saying older generation, we care about old generations, but older generation because we are worried of losing them. And with them, there are certain ideas, certain culture, social um, values that will disappear with them. So that's something we are concerned about. So we would love them, and we are working on that, to document their stories about what they want uh, to save uh, for the future. So because they can bring that in back into the street. And there is a street coordinator leader who is usually someone who is on that street, lives on that street, who takes it on. Um, who, who will manage the budget. I mean, there's a whole list of role uh, responsibilities. And then there is uh, committee members who is uh, like a whole uh, group of people. It could be part of the mahalla, the neighborhood, that work together in order to make things happen. But this has a lot of uh, people working on different aspects of it uh, and different uh, experience working on it to make this happen. Um, and this is basically what every um, group of people, what their uh, responsibilities are, from board of supporters, from street coordinator, from committee uh, members. Each one has a role. But basically, this is all uh, people who are interested 
in in uh, advancing the street. And someone asked me, said, why would people interested? Because if you're living on the street and the street is not cleaned, the garbage is not getting removed, then it affects you. And the problem is if you're l relying on a government, and let's say the government doesn't uh, send the, uh, the um, um, uh, they don't send the collectors, the garbage collectors, so the, the neighborhood stays like start having problem, um, there's a smell, the garbage is not collected. So people feel like, uh, you know, they need to take things uh, in their hand. And it's not impossible. There's a lot of uh, initiatives and case studies that we presented that shows that this has happened on different levels in different cities that doesn't have the issues that Iraq is going through. So this is one of uh, the people who actually, just for uh, us to display it, to kind of explain it, uh, for other people who were present, we, pr we were presenting to. We took this Zuqaq 27, Mahalla A23. This is in Saidiya. And uh, this is the house of the person in pink, the house of the person who was um, the team leader. He is the one who, and this is the street. And this is the neighborhood. So this is the Mahalla up. And here, this is the Zuqaq. And this is the house. And this guy, uh, um, um, you know, he took photos. We looked at what the condition of the street is. And if you can, um, I mean, this group here is not architects all, so that's good. Because, uh, I mean, this is basic things that needs to be done. It's not like we're trying to do uh, fancy things. We're just trying to restore the streets first to a, a reasonable condition, and then we can take it further. Because we were interested in engaging universities in order, in, an, in a collaborative, multidisciplinary approach, to resolve those uh, issues. But basically, these are one of the better streets. And I'll be honest, we thought to start with easier streets. Because there are streets that are impossible to solve. Because they have conflicts, and the, uh, the neighbor it doesn't like their neighbor. And that's not a typical thing for Iraq. But it had become typical after all the civil war and all the challenges and the, uh, you know, that. Uh, but but anyway, like there are things like, for example, the generator use. Like if a house uh, has a generator and the electricity goes off, and uh, the neighbor needs to talk to the their neighbor because they have shared interest in sharing the generator. So there are things that are practical that could bring people together. So we we will we were thinking that these are things that we could uh, use um, to the advantage of. Uh, solving some of the issues of building trust. But basically, these are things that the streets has. It's like uh, there's uh, damaged roads, um, no no pavement, there's no defined edge. Uh, people, and, and we can understand, like people are taking over the sidewalk and building uh, extension of their houses. Some of them are using it as a store to pay, uh, I mean, to, um, to sell uh, goods so they can... Um, uh, deal with the increase of living expenses. So we understand that these things are very delicate, and some of them uh, do this, and it's not allowed by uh, by building um, uh, by Amana, which is Dikra Alwash. I mean, she she understand the limitations because when people are going through a hard time and they don't have money and all that, and some people bribe, and there's a lot of uh, uh, things that are uh, there's happening on the street where people. Uh, don't feel they can tell their neighbor you cannot do this. So they have to keep quiet about it. So the problem just get increased, increased. Uh, and uh, one person does it, the other person does it, uh, does the same thing. And all of a sudden, uh, you don't have like um, an end of your house. The house can go all the way to the sidewalk. And the um, people are using d different designs that are not supposed to be like everyone doing all sort of different things. So there's like basically, uh, um, a very chaos, like if you have an empty land, somebody can come and build on it. I mean, um, it's, it's, there's no order. So the problem is, how can you, and, and these are all regulations, there are regulations in, in, um, in the, um, in Amanat Baghdad where you're supposed to follow these, but nobody's following them because the rules are not enforced because it's, uh, there is chaos and there is like people bribing and people uh, taking you know, abusing power and all of that. So the problem is you have to work from 
the pers the people who are living on the street by trying to build relationship with your neighbor and like uh, gradually uh, there is uh, some kind of trust getting built and uh, mutual interest and then uh, we are hoping by creating an example street other people will follow would follow uh, so basically we passed on questionnaire uh, on this uh, area uh, the Zuqaq 27 uh, uh, and these are the people who um, were uh, we, we send them list of questions of what what you think of your street, the conditions, what did you like about it before, what you don't like about it now, how do you see its future, what is it about the old street that you liked about that you want to bring back. So we were very interested in seeing what people are going to say about the street. Uh, and basically, those images were basically their thoughts about like, it's mostly about uh, the basic needs that they don't have. They don't have enough light, so it's dark, so it doesn't feel safe. The uh, the garbage collection, the recycling bin, and uh, I mean, not that they do recycling, but we were encouraging them. <laughs> and then like paved roads and sidewalk and respect of your boundaries, and that later what they were hoping that the streets still go back to looking uh, good because and now everybody is doing different designs and it looks like a very, a very, um, um, you know, it looks very m messy. <laughs> so these are uh, the thoughts of people and, and they were very engaged and it was very interesting because they thought, okay, maybe, maybe someone will help them push uh, their, uh, uh, their thoughts and their concerns forward. So these were taken, and uh, these were case studies that were done quickly, and I'm not going to go through them, because uh, when we present it to people, we o you always have to explain to people, this is not something new. This has been done. Um, so it's not impossible. And these are like from uh, people um, doing um, like um, landscaping their environments from um, uh, and how they get the funding and how they have volunteers and uh, the concepts that what they can use uh, or reuse something uh, in order to enhance the environment and uh, you know uh, people can donate uh, organizations can donate and and the street coordinator like take the budget makes sure that it gets um, distributed in the right way uh, based on the objective. So these are all like, uh, you know, uh, other initiatives in other parts of the world that has been ha uh, happened and it, uh, it was successful. Some landscaping and li uh, lighting ideas that uh, we thought that, that could be used uh, to improve because now the empty plots are all like, you know, old sofas are thrown in, like there's nothing uh, interesting, but these are all opportunities for uh, interesting uh, recycled material, like a uh, discarded uh, object that could be reused in, a, in a, an interesting way to, um, you know, to create a better uh, neighborhood and like areas that are empty, we can put like seats and uh, people can play and to encourage people to, um, mix with their neighbors because that thing was very common before in the streets of ir Iraq and now uh, people are all sitting in their homes and trying to avoid engaging with the outside world. So first we start with social media initiative. There's so much. This is not something that happens overnight. It takes time. It takes time. It's a lot about um, rebuilding and takes a while. So uh, anyway, we started with Facebook because you know we have to go through social media first to kind of bring people together. And that's when it started. And now it has uh, followers and uh, people who are sharing their experiences. And, and now we are exactly in the process of assigning all the um, all the team to have their own place and that requires a lot of interviewing to make sure we have the right people in the right seat and I think uh, like maybe you know um, Ma'ad Al-Alusi who is like an Iraqi architect who just got an I, I think Tamayu's award um, he, uh, he is wo uh, one of the board of supporters so we're trying to gather um, Iraqis uh, that has been uh, has accomplished uh, a lot and uh, they are considered like figures in Iraqi, uh, whether Hira Iraqi history or figures uh, in the future of Iraq, to be on that team. And the resources and funding, because we had to address this, um, and what we, we would need, and the tasks and the missions we need to accomplish, and the sources of funding, I'm not going to go through it, but uh, if you're interested, you can take a photo of it, if you're interested, how we, we are supposed to 
uh, find sponsors for this because it could be corporate um, um, or companies or companies that even have interest uh, in the streets specifically because some of the houses are rented to companies uh, and or donations of products and creating incentives. But the bottom line, and this is something I really, really believe in and I'm very hopeful about, is that I really believe that we need to cross-pollinate across generations. Uh, I think uh, every generation has its own value that it can contribute and also uh, having uh, the cross-pollination between different disciplines, which is something that will really take uh, forward this idea by trying to bring the human talents and the Iraqi talents together uh, to make this happen. Thank you. They don't have to, uh, they can be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was saying, my, my, we come from. Ah, you come from different institutions and uh, workplaces that could maybe cooperate with, with the project. Yeah, one minute. Um, can you imagine an approach like this on the project you showed before, the marshland projects? Could that also work? Could that also an approach like this, where you engage the people? Um, could it also work to take the marshland, the marshlands project, a bit further? Um, interesting. Uh, I'm thinking, like taking the same ap uh, approach of you mean cl uh, cross uh, pollination across generation and across disciplines to build uh, the marshes. Yes, uh, though not the same in my view. I tell you why. I think the Zuhaq and Mahalle is a very pressing issue. Like people will say, okay, you need to build schools, you need, you need all of this, it's very true. But I think if you don't solve home, neighborhood, then that's like your base is not there. Because I think is that if the home is the most important thing, right? You have to feel safe at home, you have to feel your street, you are comfortable walking in it, it, it is attractive, you don't feel like you are living in an environment that is not right, and you don't trust the people around, you don't have people to talk to. Like before, neighbors were like taking care of uh, each other's kids and all that, that's not there anymore, like, like generally speaking, of course, you know? So I think the most important thing for me is, is about priority. It's like, for me, priority is to solve this issue, at least to see, to see it, it's progressing, which I think is rebuilding trust between Iraqi people, starting from the home. So for me, marshes is a concept that do, uh, doesn't need this as much as this other thing needs it. So for me, it's like I prefer, and, and a lot of people actually, uh, Zuhaq and Mahalle is a very, um, attractive concept for many people because everybody remember their home. Everyone wants their home. When they come back and they see their home doesn't look like it before, it really breaks their heart. So they want to contribute to it. While the marshes is something that is a bit of a distant concept for a lot of people because of its vision and it's kind of a little bit far further away from uh, something that is more accessible and mu much more immediate, I would say. I was wondering about what um, what the mayor of Baghdad has told you about your plans, um, because I feel like uh, going through this, we're reducing the responsibility of the Iraqi government, because you said they told her she has no budget, but she still drives Range Rovers, all that, that, all that kind of stuff. She has 20 bodyguards, all that kind of stuff. And um, we have, the same idea here in Amsterdam. I work for the city of Amsterdam, and we have a thing that called uh, it's called food precipitation. Uh, so um, people living in neighborhood take care of their neighborhood. But the difference is, Amsterdam has made such a strong basic, so things work. You know, the if it rains, people's houses doesn't get damaged or stuff. Iraqi government hasn't done that. So if we go now and say 
all the people in the neighborhood has to work and has to do it because otherwise we're still divided. I think it's telling the government you can keep, keep going, stealing people's money, mm -hmm. doing other stuff, and um, people like you can make up some projects and the streets will be cleaned. I think it's a strange way of thinking. It's still the government that has to build a strong basic inf infrastructure and the people can maintain maybe. Yeah, completely understandable, but the problem is how to solve it. Um, I know exactly what you mean because I experienced it uh, on a different level, on a different project, where government loves it when someone is doing what I'm doing, or uh, you know, because it takes away the responsibility from them, and that's very, very true. But the problem is, if they are not doing anything about it, how long will like me as a resident on a street, accept to live in this condition when they are not m making any move. So do I wait, and this is the problem, right? Do I wait till they decide? But what if they are not? What if the, it, it's corruption? What if it is uh, not, uh, years till it happens? Do I just sit and do nothing and uh, wait for them? Because you cannot apply pressure. Like even uh, the mayor, she has a lot of challenges because they restrict her. They restrict her. They don't let her move or do anything. So anyway, if when I met the mayor, she was very supportive and encouraging. But that's all. Uh, talk about, uh, you know, do something about it. You know, uh, give me money to uh, help or solve this issue. Then it becomes a separate issue. Uh, a separate issue. So, so I definitely recognize that. Uh, Everyone, every government, uh, like uh, individual, throws it on the other person, throws it on another minister, ministry. Uh, with this uh, thing that I was going uh, uh, to try to solve, it's easy to throw it on uh, another person. And uh, my approach is, I, I can't live on the street that looks like this for many years till, till the government decide to do the right thing. So I have to take things in my own hands. That's my approach. I understand the problem with this approach is that the government uh, can be not responsible, but the government is not responsible anyway. So why why live in a in a not um, the right environment um, till they decide to do something about it? So I think I uh, there's no other choice. Can I say something? I think uh, uh, coming from also uh, like uh, brackets post war or or conflict uh, area, um, government is not. The concept of gover government can be very different, and uh, conflict uh, conflict times. It's not the way you are talking about government. It's not something that is clear and has clear rules, and uh, it's it's very different. It's broken, and um, in my opinion, in the minute you start working uh, bottom up, you're also building a society that would change vote or change or have new leaders it is much slower but it is i think the only way even of making a non-corrupt or better society is by starting small <coughs> when you have such a huge broken country huge broken system also not because only they are corrupt but because there is a lot of money from abroad that is coming that is a robbing the country of its resources b is supporting at least a huge uh, corruption. So it's not only you, like by voting, oh, you're bad, you have too many cars, I'm not going to vote for you, I'm waiting. Then you have to go to change the, the system in the US and in the system in the EU. So, um, and that is one reason why the Middle East has many depressed youth that are hopeless. And I think that these so called small initiatives built in like a fiber of society that can bring hope. No, and, and some normality. Right, right. And it's interesting because if this uh, initiative becomes successful, and this happened a lot, like you can start something and you become successful of it, and all of a sudden the government steps in and they want to take control of it and they want to like benefit from it because it helps them, right? So I in a way, I look at it as if they are at this point in time incapable in, incapable of m making a difference in people's life on that level, let's say. Uh, you know, uh, so you take it over, you do something with it, and if they take it later, and that's fine. 
that's fine. But I think to stand still and say, okay, we'll wait for them to do something about it, because it's their job at the end, you will not get anywhere and you, get, you will get very demoralized. Because at the end, you're living in that street and if it doesn't feel good and you come back every day and you see like everything is damaged and there's garbage and all that, like what's the point of waiting for someone to take care of it? And I think, I think it's like, uh, I mean, I don't believe like, okay, I have to be angry. Like I, I don't see it that way. I, I think it is just what you said. It's a government that is broken. They have a lot of challenges they're going through and not everyone is behaving the right way. And it will take its time till it kind of sorts itself out. So what do you do? Wait around? I think no, you act. Uh, you mentioned about the multidisciplinary interaction uh, to circumvent this problem of fear and trust which is there in the people. Uh, while running this project, did you come across any key insights, uh, uh, the way they interacted and the way this entire interaction built and uh, how did this entire cycle of fear and trust evolve? Did you come across any key insights which can be just transported to another place or do you see, okay, every place has to be worked out in this rigorous manner of going to grassroots and building this interaction? So were there any key learnings or insights you, you came across while- uh, Learning on uh, what exactly? On, the, on, the, on, the, on this interaction of multidisciplinary nature mm. and uh, how does it bring a bring the change in this fear and trust factor among the uh, among the constituents of that particular locality. Okay, okay. Um, I was following you and then it's a bit convoluted, but uh, okay. Uh, the multidisciplinary part uh, and the trust, is that, are you connecting these two? Okay, so so the team that is uh, part of this initiative is multidisciplinary, right? We have established that, right? Now, the people you're dealing with the, on the street is also coming from different education, experience, expertise, right? So they are kind of multi, uh, multidisciplinary, correct? So, so when you are, like if I'm an architect and I deal with an architect on the street, we have a common language, right? There is some sort of understanding because we're both architects we probably went through the same university or something so there's some kind of commonality right so i think that everyone wants to connect to someone on some level so i think that helps that helps to build to to build some trust that at least like okay you're an architect like me we probably face similar challenges and all that so i'm connected to you thus i feel more comfortable with you so that builds something that, I don't know if that's your question, but that's a positive thing when you are multidisciplinary, dealing with multidisciplinary situation because everyone can find someone they can connect to. But um, whether what are the key insights about the trust and all of that? Um, trust is something that uh, it will take time, it will take time, but I always think that if you have mutual interest in a situation, that that can build me needing you. Like let's say I need you because you have a generator and I'm suffering because I need to study for my exams and I'm five hours out of the day, I cannot study because I don't have light or there is no AC and I'm very hot and all that. So I have to be nice to you because I need from you so you can give me a little bit of your generator, right? So I have an interest in talking to you. So then there's something, there's a mutual interest, right? And that, you can develop that because there's a shared interest. We both want something. You want money from me because I'm gonna pay you for giving me a, a piece of the generator, access to the generator, so that builds something. That can happen on the street. But, but it's also how you look at it. Okay, so you have a problem with electricity, that's a negative thing, you take it as a positive thing. I can talk to my neighbor, now I have to talk to my neighbor. Maybe my neighbor is nice, and maybe like you will bring me something, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden this builds a mutual interest, right? Garbage is a, another thing. Like let's say you are living in 
Amsterdam and you are renting a house in, in Baghdad uh, on your street. And then you will say, oh, I'm not getting any good rent on it because the street they're complaining is always garbage. There's nobody removing the garbage. So you talk to the street coordinator and say, w I really want to push this. How can I help move this? So things like will grow organically and things start connecting because all of you on the street have a mutual interest in making your street better. And and the Dr. Dikras told me that actually she has done something similar to this initiative uh, on one of the streets and they were able to accomplish it. And they the did mayor. also, yeah, the mayor, and then they um, uh, you know, had a little competition and all that. So actually she was able to do that on one of the streets and she agreed that taking easier streets is better because they become a role model and other people try to meet up uh, with those expectations because they will say, oh, look how this, and it's very funny because I was talking to uh, someone and he said that he bought this land and, and he showed me the map, of, uh, he wanted me to critique the architectural design and I was shocked because the house is like that narrow and it's very long because the real estate has become so uh, tricky and there's not enough plots and the areas that look nice, they are so little and there's so many people that they start slicing the land in very thin pieces so everyone has little facade and nobody has gardens anymore. Like it's very, it's very sad because we're used to gardens and all that anyway. But my point is that streets that are looks good, their value increases. And who doesn't want their house to increase value? So I would say that, you know, I look at it in a positive way. Let the government get out of my way, you know? Let me do what I wanna do because this is an opportunity. Hey, uh, for me, it's still not really clear what the exact added value is of this initiative. Uh, as you say, as I can con uh, conclude from your words, uh, the rebuilding of the city is something that is done by the local people uh, with the local means and with the local funding, which is present or not present, we don't know. Um, so is it coordination? Is it funding that you provide? Is it the knowledge? Are you trying to take over the role of the governments as some kind of coordinator of this uh, whole process of uh, rebuilding the cities. Um, yeah, so that is still not really clear for me. Okay, um, are you talking about me or the people who are doing this initiative? Uh, I'm talking about the initiative from the New York uh, Institute of Architecture as I think this is what this initiative comes from. No, 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 no? it's not related. No, it's not related. Okay. Well, let's say the organization that is behind this initiative. I don't the, know the, the exact hierarchy of the organization. No, no, no. It's uh, the people. Uh, it's this initiative is grassroots, right? So it's not uh, related to any organization. It's not. It's the people. It's a bunch of people like me, you, and people here come together and they want to change their street. That's basically it. But you still, as let's say, uh, you are not a local. I think, uh, uh, let's say, as an outsider, you come to uh, a place to still have a role in the rebuilding of the city. So for me, it's not really clear what your exactly organization initiative is. Okay. Um as I said, I'm, I'm going to be specific because maybe that will help. Um, I am strategic advisor on this. This is uh, has been handed to people who are passionate about it, who reached out, who wants to work on it. Okay, they are organizing themselves uh, in the in those uh, kind of structure that we are talking about, and that structure is actually in the process of developing further to make sure we, we um, fulfill all the roles. This is uh, an initiative by the people. They, the people who are part of that group will also be people who are in financials, in, in fin financing, in fundraising, that they will um, bring money in to support this initiative. Thank you. Um, hi, I was wondering, um, you are doing projects in Iraq uh, as well in other places. Um, currently, Syria is a country which is, um, well, torn apart by war. According to your expertise or according to your experiences, what would be 
the main takeaway or maybe the first challenge or the first action uh, that you would suggest that uh, people there uh, implement or that the government there could implement? Do you have any thought about that? And, and you mean in Syria? Yes, or in general, it could be any country that is trying to build up its uh, its its cities and its society. But Syria, of course, is uh, also in the Middle East, and well. I mean, uh, can I talk about Iraq, or do you want like a general, ge general? Uh, maybe yeah. it, it will be a same recommendation as for Iraq. I was just curious: is there? Um, <sighs> I, I, I don't know. Is is there a, a common lesson that that that? Uh, I mean, I I. Um, I try to shy away from generalization uh, because uh, because sometimes it doesn't apply and then I, it doesn't sound mature enough to kind of comment on something. Though there might be a very, um, there is maybe a thread between the two places, but I cannot really comment uh, on Syria because I'm not working on, uh, on, on Syria. Um, but I can talk about Iraq because I have more experience and exposure to that system and how it works. Because rebuilding uh, might have to be crafted for every place to work with all the challenges that place have. And I cannot generalize the challenges, honestly, uh, because it will like, yeah, yeah, it would not be <laughs> wise to, uh, to generalize the challenges. But I can talk about Iraq, uh, because rebuilding, in my opinion, has to have uh, on many fronts, on many fronts. Yeah. And I think uh, um, it's needed different ways to accomplish this. This is just an idea of uh, something to rebuild the streets because we didn't see anyone doing something about it. But I think there are so many things that can be done. Uh, and I think Iraq has a specific situation. There is um, a problem in the government that there is uh, people are uh, in fear and uh, there is corruption and people don't take responsibility. So this, these are really big challenges. So you have to work around that in order to accomplish things. And that is very unique. Uh, I mean, very unique, I would say. It's not necessarily unique to Iraq, but uh, I, I see it as, as a one, one thing that you need to address on its own like, and yes, not like lump it. You need to take all the circumstances yes, into consideration. Yes. It, 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 yes. Like I cannot generalize because I don't know Syria if w the issue is f the same fear or corruption because yeah. we have issue of fear and and not taking responsibility is a big one. Okay, sufficient. I just have a, have a question. Uh, just very short one. Uh, the question is when we're gonna have a break. <laughs> we're wrapping up. Okay, that's in great. In fact, we're wrapping up. Thank you so much. <laughs> I had a I had a question yeah. here. Yeah, uh, I, you told that uh, there is a problem, a religion problem, that uh, this is why they cannot uh, be together in one street. Uh, could you explain a little bit more because uh, of the difference uh, of religions, and uh, maybe uh, if it is the problem, could uh, solve to get them together these two religion rather to separ separated them? I mean, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a very uh, it's a very difficult, and I, I usually don't like to uh, comment, but I would say in brief, um, it's the same religion, it's a different sect, but any divide is used by political, for political reasons, to create extreme, like like let's say uh, me and you is very similar in so many ways, right? But somebody wants to separate us, so they start highlighting the difference between me and you, right? So so it is done and used to separate us on purpose. But the truth is, those uh, two sects they marry from each other, the, the, uh, you know, and it uh, there are stories. There are many stories where the wife is belongs to one like Shea and the husband is Sunni, and they came to come to them and say, no, you have to leave this, or you le have to leave this house, go to another neighborhood. So it's all used to create divide, uh, to um, force uh, power, and it's money, mo money, power, basically that plays the role to create that divide, but it's not real divide, it's just constructed. Let's remember that. 
this was not before the war. And let's remember that the war came from the US. So it's not, it's yeah, not the, the natural. The yeah, yeah. The yeah. yeah. The yeah. The no, this, the this, this was not because of religion, although I'm not from Iraq, but I can say from the Middle East. Because they are already married to each other, it's not like a, it's a very common thing. But it was used, uh, you know, for political reasons. And now we know because of the mm. war, the Norman, the political crisis of the war. Mm. There is one crisis in the Middle East that has been the Norman in Iraq. It's happening in Europe, 300 million people being forced out of the country because of the war. It's not because they want to get rich. Yeah. Yes, can I, I think we should, we should yeah. round off. So my question, it's in, in line with the lady said from the uh, Amsterdam City Hall. Uh, uh, Amsterdam City Hall, of course, they have a healthy budget and they have a, a st stable budget to work with their, uh, to develop their neighbors in Amsterdam and to engage also the society from to develop their neighbors. So my question, um, it's clearly we have lack of trust in Iraq uh, with the authorities and between people uh, themselves as well. So. Um, if we don't have a trust in our authorities, so uh, uh, how we can have uh, a healthy and stable budget to work with our society to develop the street, the Sugaq and Mahalle in Baghdad? Because I don't think the idea will last longer on the just donating. Thank you. So <laughs> you're trying to see how we can reach uh, the government or like kind of build. Listen, the trust between. Uh, the government and the people is very broken. Mm. Yes. My, my question is like how to have stable budget to have this idea to like work for a very long time because I was in Spain I was in Iraq and I can only have a, a, a nice idea amazing idea but wait for a very short time and then I will uh, start, start to fight with some people. You're asking an architect how should she have mm. a stable mm. budget for the government. Mm. I think mm. it's a little bit like mm. Yeah, oh, oh, how can you? Yeah. yeah, it's okay. If, but I'm going to answer. If you have answer. the answer, <laughs> it would be great. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, it, it's not a question to have an answer for. Uh, but but I, I will use it to kind of go into two things. One is that uh, the relationship between the government and the people is a very interesting one because, of course, it's n there's no trust. And it's funny because I, I when I go... Uh, when I go in Iraq, I usually take taxis. And everybody's like, why are you taking taxis? Do uh, there's no, I mean, I do take taxis and I listen to what the taxi driver says. It's very interesting. <laughs> I really enjoy it. So uh, they always like, uh, you know, gossip, of course, uh, you know, about this and that. And this guy is like doing this and all that. And I just listen to it and try to understand what the story is and all that. So I realize there's a big issue. There's a huge gap, huge gap. And I know there are people working on bridging that gap. Uh, gap. And it will take time to bridge that gap. But I think that the government also is aware that there is this gap. And they are trying to do programs and, and uh, other things in order to bridge that gap. So that is happening, but it will take time. That's one. Now, in terms of this initiative, again, I don't see it as I have to connect it to the government. This initiative will only succeed by generating its own funds. And the funds is not internal. The, first, the funds can come from an external, from people, Iraqi people who are living outside, from organization, from nonprofit, from Kickstarter. There's a lot of things that can happen. And I cannot uh, tell you that, oh, uh, uh, it can end. No, I've seen it happening before, and it can go on. But I'm not saying it's going to, uh, uh, you know, it's the people who are putting this team together and, like, the people who are on the team who is going to make it grow and it can make it successful, but it requires energy and it re requires commitment and vision. I think now the last comment, absolute last. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, very short. Uh, uh, so my question is about uh, you and your art now, because we saw that okay, you did so many diverse projects, one in Manhattan and one in the marshes, and now in the Baghdad trying to rebuild. What's next for you? Like. What is you are aiming for your art now? 
Okay, a good question. <laughs> I need to like be on the beach looking at the stars. But anyway, um, it's very interesting because listen, I go through uh, many um, uh, uh, you know talks uh, with myself. Uh, trying to see because you know the problem is with someone like me who's very passionate who is very driven I have also uh, uh, Amount of energy that is not like unlimited forever, right? So sometimes I have to watch where I'm spending my energy and of course I want to put my energy where uh, It can produce the most impact so it is an issue that I uh, keep thinking about and um, recently there was a, a client that uh, I decided, but see, the problem is I decided not to work with this client because he will give me more headache and I, I, I'm not so sure I'm going to get where I need to get. Uh, but at the same time, he has an important project, but he doesn't know what he's doing. And the problem is he doesn't know what he's doing. And then after f two months, I realized he doesn't know, he doesn't know that he's not, he doesn't know. So it's, it's a very complex problem. So, so it, it, it is very hard because my passion uh, and my commitment and my sense of responsibility, I want to bring these people to the level where they do good work. But sometimes I feel the gap is very big. So this is my decision is like, which projects will not consume me and the result uh, I will still be unhappy with. So that's kind of like the, the dialogue I have with myself. Thank you very much, Rayani. Thank you, thank you, thank and, you. Uh, beautiful people, this is a perfect moment to end. And I must say that this is a also a positive energy to see so many Amsterdamers coming in this little drizzle mm -hmm. to hear about the project in Baghdad. And this shows that there is a lot of positive also cooperation and hope for this world. I, I like this. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.